I am often asked, as I talk about the disruption of technology and how it changes our society, what is the right age to introduce people to these concepts? And shouldn't we, rather than talking to executives uh, or people who are founding startups, actually target high schoolers or even sooner children in elementary school so that they understand the power of exponential technologies and what is happening in society sooner rather than later. This is an important challenge, of course. The younger the mindset, the more dynamic it is and the more readily it can accept the new rules that are driving our societies rather than having to demolish the dogmatic assumptions that have been accrued uh, through decades uh, of uh, experience being exposed to more traditional places at the workplace or at college uh, a little earlier. And having demolished these uh, dogmatic assumptions, reconstruct a worldview uh, with uh, great effort, but also uh, with uh, the danger that comes from having lost uh, uh, the roots supporting us. So on the surface, uh, it would look that the advantage is to actually start sooner, start in high school, start in um, elementary school. And is this true? Is this the case? There are certainly skills that are not uh, innate that we can learn very early. Uh, how we learn to walk is biologically programmed in what we are. Uh, we um, have legs and uh, all our muscle movements, uh, the ways that we learn to grab chairs and then uh, in a magical moment for the parents that look, let hold, let, let go, uh, of, of, of the chair and take the first steps uh, unaided uh, on, on our two legs. Well, these are things that uh, uh, are unstoppable and natural for, for all of us. There are other skills that we can learn very early. For example, riding a bicycle that are much less natural and actually much less intuitive. The, the fact that uh, we are moving our legs uh, in a certain way and the world around us moves in a way that is completely different from what would be natural to expect with respect to the movement of our legs is something that we have to understand reprogramming our brain, reprogramming our intuition, reprogramming our muscle memories. A demonstration of uh, the plasticity of the brain that can be experienced uh, at any age uh, is uh, linked uh, to this. Uh, if you go um, on a treadmill and uh, maybe you watch a screen uh, or you work, there are now treadmill desks for working while uh, uh, walking on a, on a treadmill, presumably not running, and you do this for an extended period of time, um, let's say an hour, when you get off, the natural and traditional movement uh, of walking will be misaligned with the expectations of your other sensory input, most importantly, your vision. Because during that hour, your brain got accustomed to the fact that even though you are walking, the world is unchanging. So for a few moments, when you get off the treadmill and you walk, the fact that the world is coming closer is interpreted by your brain as if you were much faster than not what your legs are telling you. It is quite disconcerting. Another um, example of this same kind of brain plasticity that uh, uh, all of you can uh, experience is climbing on an escalator that is not moving. 
we are accustomed to the little jolt of uh, dynamic acceleration uh, when we step on the first few uh, stairs of the escalator and then either we stand still or we keep uh, walking upwards, but we are in motion. And then when the escalator ends, as we get off, there is the same kind of uh, jolt of negative uh, deceleration. And uh, then we resume walking normally. However, when the escalator is not moving because maybe it's broken, but you still walk up uh, it, the first few steps again are incredibly disconcerting because the expectation of change that is not happening in our state of motion uh, misaligns our muscle memory with uh, our brain as it has been previously programmed. So, the ability of learning skills is there, whether we are young or, or older. The question really is, should we expose very young people to the uncertainty and to the uh, stress of a worldview that is based on disruption, that is based on accelerating change? Is it the right thing to do? Well, in the past, we decided that it definitely wasn't. Not only we structured the educational system in a manner that is resisting change, as every bureaucracy does, but uh, even more so because the protagonists of the educational system, the teachers themselves, in a position of authority and respect that they need to maintain towards their students, cannot afford to say that they are confused or they don't know something or that what is going on in the world is hard to decode and the tools that uh, we have available may not be sufficient to, to do so. But we went even beyond. We created all kinds of fairy tales and metaphors and magical explanations that are all there to pretend knowledge when the knowledge is missing and pretend explanations when the explanations are um, potentially too complex or would require a chain of knowledge that is, that is lacking. So in the past, this wasn't the case. Can this be the case today? How can we go from here to there? How can we achieve an educational system that uh, is able to admit its own ignorance, that is able to experiment uh, uh, in front of the unknown, that is uh, putting teachers and students um, potentially on the same level uh, in front of the task of uh, decoding the path uh, of uh, our interactions with new technologies and, and new ways of acquiring and managing and deploying knowledge. I am skeptical because just as the proactive attitude and the courageous experimentation on the side of adults in the population is, in general is available only to a very small percentage, that must be more or less the same among teachers as well. And we would want the school system to uh, adapt in a uniform manner to this challenge. If we tell teachers, hey, don't pretend you know everything. Tell the kids that you are as confused as uh, uh, anybody else and um, start experimenting. That kind of organization would uh, be extremely different from school to school. And we wouldn't want that to happen. And parents, very importantly, wouldn't want that to happen. 
And in our current educational system, the three components of students and teachers and parents must all agree how to implement any kind of change. And the parents are, of course, key here. There could be some who are very open and say, well, I don't want to lie to my kids. I don't want to pretend that uh, a lot of what we are teaching them is uh, going to be very useful. Um, uh, a lot of uh, what we do in school is to teach them how to learn, uh, but uh, in a very indirect manner. Um, so if we can do without all those, all that uh, indirectness and just teach very directly. These are tools for learning. These are tools for uh, thought. Uh, in the previous episode of the context, uh, we referred to that very explicitly of how our tools for thinking evolve and become better. So if we follow that in our school system, potentially a lot of time will be freed up. Think about it how much time is spent in the school to teach um, the children facts to the point where uh, if they realize and want to start using Wikipedia or other systems that accelerate their ability to leverage facts in order to do something with them, uh, often they are punished. And this, this punishment is a clear indication of the resistance of the educational system to embrace uh, a new agreement around what should be taught and how it should be taught. And if some parent is not as open and not as ready to start some new educational system where experimentation is constant and uh, we are all uh, looking at the results and analyzing them and admit uh, if we fail and we start over, well, they could be pretty justified in claiming that the experiments are not only the things that are done at school, but the experiments uh, or the experimental subjects are the student themselves and they would be able to come and say, sorry, I don't want my children to be experimented upon. I want the school to expose my children to known facts, to known methods, in order to achieve the expected outcome of a well-educated, well-adapted person who can then enroll in college, for example, uh, and go on in his or her life. And the school would have no way of stopping that parent or, or provide a counter argument because if the school is honest, it would have to confirm that the new method has no guarantees of achieving an intended outcome. And indeed, the experiments uh, are actually done on the students as well. Now, what this could mean is that the danger of opening the minds of younger and younger people to the uncertainties of disruption that exponential technologies are bringing in our world is preparing them for a struggle that may lead to them leaving the traditional school system. Because the necessity of conformity could be a price that they are not ready to pay. They may achieve a, a, a level of uh, self-confidence or uh, self-consciousness where the compromise required to uh, adopt the methods that they know are uh, ineffective in today's and especially tomorrow's world uh, is, is not something that they want to 
abide by. And then it is even more important that there uh, is an alignment uh, within a family for the parents to realize that this kind of attitude is the at least partially the intended outcome of what is happening. That uh, the parent, if he or she is uh, uh, honest, must tell the, the child, you are actually right. So in my own family, uh, that is kind of what happened. Uh, all three of my children uh, have gone through uh, periods uh, of uh, growth and maturity and, and increasing degree of self-awareness that led them to leave the traditional school system, either later or earlier. And this is, of course, um, pretty seriously non-conformist. I wouldn't expect a large percentage of uh, families to be able or to want to do the same. And we don't yet know, of course, exactly what the final outcome is going to be, whether in another 50 years time, uh, my children will evaluate uh, this uh, positively or negatively, even if uh, we are crossing our fingers uh, for the, the, the positive. But it is important that they are actually very active in acquiring knowledge, in acquiring tools, in acquiring skills, in different areas that prepare them to be adaptable, that prepare them to cope with the change. And this is kind of the polar opposite of what is achieved through a traditional educational path from elementary school to high school to college to a postgraduate program to, through a PhD and then achieve an extreme degree of specialization and then either follow with various research grants and programs to apply that specialization um, and then maybe through some patents uh, and uh, other uh, ways of applying that specialization go forth uh, in an entrepreneurial path uh, or um, in an academic path to teach and keep researching, adding publications, adding uh, new findings uh, following on that journey. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who are, are happy with that path. We know it is not scalable. We know that uh, only a sliver of the children that, that start school will end up in that. So what we must keep searching for is scalable solutions, is the ability to teach how to think, to teach how to learn, to teach how to adapt to the changes, to teach how to recognize that uh, the lack of certainty is not lack of respect in a relationship between either peers or even uh, in a more hierarchical relationship. That the value and the gain from honesty, openness, and truth is much higher than the false narrative of stable falsehoods. So I hope you enjoyed this um, latest episode of uh, The Context. And uh, uh, I recorded it in, in, uh, in New York, you may see a different background. I don't know if uh, I will be able to eliminate uh, in uh, uh, post-editing all the noises of sirens and, and everything else that is going on here. If you enjoyed it, you can support 
uh, the context on Patreon with as little as uh, $5 a month, which is the suggested amount. As a matter of fact, you can become a supporter for even less. Uh, the link is available to name your own level of support, uh, whatever you believe uh, is the right amount and whatever uh, you can economically uh, sustain. Uh, for me, uh, the pleasure is uh, to continue these um, and uh, not only record episodes, but to um, establish uh, a dialogue, a conversation. I greatly enjoy uh, the feedback that I receive, uh, emails, tweets, uh, Facebook comments, and uh, everything else in the various platforms where we interact. So I invite you to uh, do so, ask me questions, and uh, let's continue the conversation.